Stand for opening him. Glory to God on high.
be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all our hearts are open, all our desires strong, and from you the most secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dry, Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us from sin and death. Breathe upon us with the power of your Spirit, that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in holiness and right living all our days. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the readings of God's Word. Christ, 
and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to, toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard. And she anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who would betray Jesus, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal from it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. give you thanks for gathering us this morning in this place, this beautiful place of worship. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together in joy in the midst of everything that go on that happens in our life. We can gather joyfully and praise you. And we pray now as we look at your word, Lord, that you would open our minds and hearts that we may understand you and draw closer to you, that you may have more of us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what I look like. <laughs> Amen. It's good not to have a mask on. Remember we had that little bit of time that we didn't have to have a mask on because I could be behind the plexiglass shield? Remember that? Because my breath was bad. Anyway. Not that, I mean, I brush my teeth and stuff, but anyway, you get the point. Um, if, does anybody remember in 2008? Well, it was a little while ago. We were at the Olympics, the Canadian team, and there was, uh, there was a guy, uh, Brian Price, you might not remember, but he was, uh, uh, here's a sports term for you, Cox Wayne. Does anybody know what a co Oh, did you put that? Oh, they're going to guess it now. Somebody knows what a coxswain is? Coxswain is that tiny guy in the front, Brian Price. He's the little guy in the back of the boat, and he's got things on his feet that he can manipulate, and he uses his words um, to, to uh, guide the, these, you know, five foot ten, or pardon me, six foot ten 
a huge men uh, to, to get the boat going uh, faster. Brian Coxwain, uh, 2008 Olympics, Canada was not expected to do um, as well as they did. We went away, you might remember, with the gold medal in rowing, which was like, what? Where did that come from? Anyway, Brian uh, Price is from Belleville, which is my hometown. And he came back with his gold medal on, and he was met when he got on the bus. Oh, this huge crowd of people, of, yay, you're Brian, you're an Olympic hero, this is amazing. And, and there were banquets held for him, and he was a guest speaker at different things. And, and wherever he went, he got free drinks and free food. And he uh, sometimes would go out to the, to, the, um, to the bar, and he'd wear his medal. And people would be like, oh, it's Brian, it's so cool. They'd be getting selfies. And, you know, it was a really big deal that he, um, he came back to his hometown, and he was a hero uh, to us. He recently, he just, just um, very recently, decided to give it a give it a break. He's put his Olympic um, uh, career. Uh, he said, I, "I finished" because he wants to hang out with his wife and family. But it's just this beautiful idea that, that he, when he came back, he was welcomed as a hero. Today, when we read in the Gospels that Jesus goes to Bethany, it's a little bit like when Brian Price went back to Galva. Because this hometown, this Bethany, though it's not where Jesus was born, he provided or performed one of his most amazing miracles. And that is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus is actually there. That whole community is filled with faith because of that one miracle. Because they see Lazarus walking around in their community. Hey, there's that guy that was dead and now he's alive. That's awesome. How did that happen? Oh, I've got to tell you about this Jesus guy. And all these people were coming to faith. And more than that, people were actually, it tells us in the Gospels, were coming just to see Lazarus himself. He was a walking testimony of the miraculous that Christ did. And so when Jesus comes to Bethany, it's this huge party. Like, oh, we're going to have a dinner party. We're going to invite everybody. You just see your face, Jim. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to see some people's face. It's good to... Um, oh, I, I forgot to say in the announcements, uh, super, lots of grace to flow around the masking, right? So masks are going to be around probably forever. Um, just lots and lots of grace around, around giving people distance and wearing masks. Anyway, Brian, Jesus arrives at this, at this place in Bethany, and they decide, well, we better put on a banquet for you. So they get a big dinner party going, and all the people are invited. Lazarus is sitting there, like, oh, there's the guy. And oh my gosh, there's Jesus, the guy who did this. It's amazing. And... Because it's very close to the Passover, it says six days away from Passover, because we're on our way to Holy Week. This is the day before Jesus' triumphal entry. There's likely people from Jerusalem. It's only a couple of miles away. The city's already filling up with pilgrims. So likely some of those have already come to Bethany. So it's a big party. It's noisy. It's exciting. And there's lots of people involved. It's the best kind of dinner party you could think of. And out of all of this noise and all of the eating and the excitement and the joy, Mary comes out with a, with a bottle of perfume. It says pure nard, which is to say, we might say, um, you know, if you buy essential oils and it's the real thing, it says 100% essential oil. And if you buy something that smells like essential oil, it just says like lavender scent underneath it. And you're like, well, that's not really real, is it? No, it's not. When it says pure nard, it means that this is the 100% uh, pure. And it's very expensive. The gospel says it's 300 denarii. I don't know about you, but I instantly uh, put things in dollars. I'm like, 300 bucks? That's a bargain! Right, men? Come on. Perfume is expensive. Is it not? I haven't bought perfume in ages. Terry doesn't really wear it. Oh, I thought somebody was screaming at me for saying that comment. Um, right? Perfume is, right? Like it's, you know, it's a hundred dollars, it's two hundred dollars. You get a really good, you know, it's hundreds of dollars. But a denarii, that's not the, the right equation. Um, denarii is a day's labor for a laborer. So uh, when John's saying it's 300 denarii, he's saying it's worth 300 days of a laborer's wages, which is about $30,000 to us. So $30,000 worth of perfume in this little jar. It, it's very, very expensive. So you would just like maybe dip the tip of your finger in it and use just the tiniest amount. It's also very potent. Do any of you know that you're, um, oh my gosh, I forgot the name of the clock. What are the things in your nose that smell with? 
You're sp um, doing what? I can't even, I can't hear you guys. That's funny. Auto factories? Oh, I was like, that's fancy. You're smelling things in your nose. You know? They, they, um, they, they get used to smells. Uh, farmers, for instance, they sometimes don't notice the manure smell. I'm not kidding, it's not because they're, what's that? But yes, it's very, and, and uh, perfume. Perfume, if you've worn the same perfume for a while, you stop, you stop smelling it. And that's why sometimes you'll come across a man or a woman who has been wearing the same perfume for decades, and they start off with one squirt, and then they went two, and three, and four, five, and then it's kind of like, <laughs> and they walk into a room and it's, whoa, wow, can you ever smell Mrs. Insert name, that's none of you. Uh, what's that? Grandma. Grandma, insert, yes, sometimes grandma. Uh, no, there's this, right, there's this wafting smell. And if you've met people, there's other cultures um, where it's important to be perfumed. I have friends who uh, lived in the Middle East uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia uh, for 20 years. And in Saudi, you, uh, the, everyone is expected to be like doused in cologne and perfume. You're expected to smell that way. And when your elders come over, you need to get you get cleaned up, and then you douse yourself in in perfume before you go and meet them. Um, so it can be a cultural thing as well. Um, when Mary pours out this perfume, it fills the whole house with this smell. It's a beautiful smell. It fills the whole house. And then Mary takes down her hair and uses her hair to wipe the feet. Of Christ. And you think about hair, there's still some stuff about hair that kind of exists in our culture. Uh, but at that time, in Christ's time, uh, hair was very important for men and for women, the way that it was treated and the way it was presented in public and in private. Um, for women, if you were married, your hair was up and covered when you went out into the public. Why? It was to say, uh, here I am, I'm a woman. And I am beautiful and feminine, but part of me, my, part of my beauty and femininity is not for you to look at, because I am taken, and I belong to somebody else. So their hair was, was covered, and then when they would come home, they could let their hair down and uncover their hair. Other things went on with you know, men and not cutting their hair and the way that they wore it. Uh, there are times also in the Old Testament when women and men would shave their heads uh, in religious devotion. So uh, both having their hair covered or having a shaved head had religious connotations to it. Both were seen as, as, uh, as humility, right? Doing things that were very humble. But a woman would never show her hair uh, out in the public, right? It was always covered to show this, this modesty. So for Mary, in this room of many unmarried men, and also women, it's basically a public event, to take her hair down is an act of intimacy. I have to pause there for a minute because Hollywood has got intimacy so confused. When I say intimacy, we instantly think sexuality and sex. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about biblical intimacy, which is intimacy in relationship. That is growing in depth with one another to know one another. Intimacy is one form of that, but not necessarily the primary form. Uh, so here, Mary taking her hair down in front of Christ and the others in the room is an instant sign of her showing intimacy towards Christ. It is also a revealing of her personal beauty. A woman's hair in that time was a symbol of her beauty and a symbol of her femininity. And to reveal it was to reveal part of her beauty and part of her femininity. And so she, taking that, the, her hair down, she's instantly drawing closer to Christ in relationship, and she's showing him her beauty and her femininity. This beautiful sign. And then she uses this, this symbol of, of her beauty and her femininity to wipe the dirtiest part of Christ's body. His feet. She uses something of her that is the most beautiful to wipe what is 
the most dirty on Christ. Now it's interesting, um, you know, we probably would have told this story, we'd still hear in church if Mary had come out and poured a little bit of the perfume on Jesus and wiped his feet with her hands, right? We would have heard that story. Nobody would have uh, said anything bad about Mary if she'd done that. But Mary takes $30,000 worth of perfume and pours the whole thing out until every last drop comes out of it. And then she takes her beauty and femininity that had been covered and unravels it and wipes the dirtiest part of Christ's body. It's a beautiful act of honor and devotion and worship of Christ. Mary doesn't hold anything back here. She's not sort of, oh, I'll just give you a little bit of who I am. She just, she just gives it, she pours it out until it's empty. Another gospel says she breaks the top off and pours the whole jar out. She just, she's just so abandoned in worship to Christ that she holds nothing back. She just pours out in front of him her love and devotion to him. And then this smell, the gospel says, it, it, it fills the air. This perfume just fills the air. It's like Aunt Gladys coming into the room, except instead of doing the cloud of perfume, she broke the top off the port of it, And she just fills up the room with prayer, with, with, with this perfume. In the Old Testament, when you hear about um, incense, uh, perfume, it's always, almost always associated with prayer. Incense is incense. Incense associated with prayer, the burning of incense. They go, priests go into the temple, they burn the incense, and they're praying. Or you might hear they were gathered outside the temple at the hour of the burning of incense. And so when, we, when you think of incense, it is always linked with praying. Uh, and sometimes we imagine that image of the incense kind of rising up uh, to the other dimension um, where Christ is, into, in, into heaven, right? Uh, that, and that's kind of how our prayers descend, you might think of. And so when the gospel writer says that the room is filled with the smell, it reminds us then of the room being filled with prayer. As in the Old Testament, the, the smell is the smell of prayer. Uh, oh my gosh, almost a decade. Can I say a decade? Guys, I'm getting older, hey? Uh, like a decade ago, when I, I was at St. Thomas's in Toronto, uh, which is nicknamed Smoky Tom's. And they're called Smoky Toms because every Sunday uh, they have the third row up, which is where you burn the incense. And it's, and it's up the aisle, down the aisle, around the, it's all over the place. And it's, gosh, it's a lot of fun to use. And uh, they buy double smoke incense, right, to get a lot of smoke in the room. And then on Easter Sunday, we not only use the double smoke incense, but we put in three times the amount. Oh, it's good. So the place is just, it's, it's filled with incense, and uh, it gets in your clothes, and in your nose, and in your hair. And I remember it was a Sunday after Easter, and I was uh, pulled out the, the um, accolade robe that I was wearing, and I smelled it, I said, oh, it smells like Easter. And the priest said something quite revealing to me. He said something, I don't remember exactly the words, but he said, um, Robert, that's the, that's the smell of, of worship. And it was so beautiful to me to think you know, when I, I pick up this particular piece of clothing that I wear for church, and it's only worn for church and worship, and then I smell it, and it smells of worship. And, and in that Old Testament way, it, it smells of the people's prayers and the people's worship. So when Mary breaks this jar and fills the room, it's filling the room not only with this beautiful smell, but it's filling the room with her worship. And it's covering Everybody in the room, everybody left there smelling of pure nerd. And I think of uh, what we're heading into. Uh, in the Gospels, it's the next day is, is, is uh, uh, Palm Sunday. We're going to wait a week and we're going to do it next Sunday. But for Christ, he knows it's the next day. He sees in Mary's uh, worship here, he instantly sees his burial. And he instantly relates it to his death. Leave her alone, he says to Judas. She has done this for my burial because that, ins that perfume that's been poured on him stays on him 
for Palm Sunday and all through Holy Week, for his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. He is wearing that perfume for the whole thing. And it just caught me, I don't know, every once in a while, you know, the scriptures catch in a different way. And just this year, I realized when I was reading it that Mary offers this, this form of worship that only a woman uh, can offer. It is so gentle and so nurturing as she offers her gift of beauty. And she wraps his feet in her hair with this beautiful perfume in this nurture and love and honor and a passion, just a burning passion for love of Christ. And she does that days before Christ is handed over to men who will treat him so brutally and treat his body as if it was worthless. We have this image of, of feminine worship this beautiful worship that Mary offers. So what does this mean for us, other than it's a beautiful worship? Uh, it, I think it, it can influence how we worship, right? Are we like Mary, and we, we really give ourselves, you know? I remember hearing Martha Dawn speak once, if you haven't heard, she's a Christian, right? An amazing woman, who her body is just failing her, and she, anyway, just she writes out of such uh, passion and also humility. And she said, I can't wait for the day when I get to a church and the people, everybody in the pew is so excited about worshiping when they get there, not kind of halfway through the service. And I'm sitting there as an Anglican seminar, and I'm like, yeah, Martha, that's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, no, are we allowed to do that as Anglicans? Uh, you know, like, yeah, you can be passionate about worship. It doesn't mean you have to jump up and down on your hands and do these. Although if you want to do that, that's cool. I'm totally allowable, but... What would it look like for us to be so excited? I mean, sometimes you get out of bed in church, and you know, you gotta drag yourself to church, and what would it look like for us to come like Martha does? I'm so excited to be here, Lord, because I want to worship you. You are so important in my life. I just want to honor you today. And you know, some days we need to be in church because we need to be here, right? We need to, we need to know that God loves us and hear from other people and be encouraged. Sometimes we can come to church because it's good for us to worship Him and to honor Him. Do we give all to Him? Do we give Him our all? Or do we kind of hold stuff back? Like, oh, you know, Lord, I'm going to give you this out of my life and these things in my life, but this stuff over here I'm still going to take care of because I think I'm a better steward or whatever it is. Mary just, she was just so out for Him. And then Paul talks about um, what it is to be fragrant as Christians. What does it mean for you and I? Do you, do you guys know you smell? Did you know that? I smelled you on the way in. Every single one of you. I know you're all covering up like, I put my deal over your No, you all smell. Paul says that you smell of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 2, 15, he talks about uh, Christians carrying around the aroma of Christ. The, in the knowledge of God that we carry around with us, we are the aroma of Christ. Sometimes you hear us Christians are called the light of the world. Any of you remember the song? It goes like this. Join in if you want. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hey, you guys remember? So that's one image of us as the light. But, but Paul uses the image of us being an aroma. And the cool thing about light is it spreads in places that don't invite it. And the aroma also does the same thing. So like Aunt Gladys, who's got way too much perfume on, when Christians walk into a space, we bring with us the aroma. Christ. We bring with us the truth of Christ. We may be surrounded by people who do not yet know the Lord, and we have a stench, the stench of Christ. Paul says, to those who are perishing, that is, to those who have turned away from God, we smell of death. But to those who are, who are interesting, who are yearning to know God, we are the smell, we are the incense to those around us. 
uh, Craig Barnes uh, gave, a, gave a sermon several years ago. He was uh, invited to a funeral, and this man uh, who had died had been uh, one of the builders and creators, engineers on the uh, Bowen 747 uh, plane. And uh, after the service, his wife came up to, to Mr. Barnes and, and she said, you know, my husband did the most remarkable thing. He worked on a tiny little switch box that's in the Boeing 747 for 15 years, working to make sure that it worked perfectly. And she said, when my husband saw the Boeing 747 take off for the first time, it was one of the happiest days in his life. Because he knew that he did his little part exceptionally well. He goes on to say that sometimes we think in our own lives that the little pieces that we do in our lives to bring Christ uh, might seem seemingly unimportant. You think, oh, that's not really a big deal that I did that little thing. But in the economy of God, when heaven once again comes down, to establish itself on earth, when God's kingdom comes, you and I will see all of the small acts that we have done that are incredibly essential in the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, you are the aroma of Christ. You take Christ wherever you go. Let us pray. Father, we, we just thank you for your servant Mary and for this beautiful act of worship that we see this morning of this expensive and pure perfume being totally poured out and for her offering of her beauty and femininity to wipe Christ's feet before the brutality of Holy Week. Father, we pray that you would inspire us Inspire us, Lord, to be those who worship you wholeheartedly. That give our all for you. Not one foot in, Lord, but both feet in. And Lord, we pray that you would encourage us as we live in this world to be the aroma of Christ, to bring the truth of God wherever we are. Come and inspire and encourage us and empower us by your Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand. Let us confess our faith as we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the conscious light, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. I invite you to kneel as you are able for our friends. Let us pray. At the end of each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite your response of, hear our prayer. Lord, may our praise of you never cease. May our worship be unending, and our love find new depths in you. May you draw us closer, preparing and bringing us new hope and healing. May we 
journey to the cross prayerfully, purposefully, even through suffering, life's trials, doubts, questions, sorrows, and our deep searchings until we find our rest in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for your church. As you invite us deeper into your kingdom purposes, may this Lenten season be one of outward focus, seeking you in those who we often and we often ignore. Help us to live sacrificially, focused on bringing your love, your peace, your generosity to those who need to hear your gospel message of salvation and hope. Father, let us be a fragrant offering to our communities around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we are grateful and give thanks for the delegation of indigenous, indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, residential school survivors, and bishops who met with Pope Francis this past week. May the healing and reconciliation journey continue to be strengthened by dialogue and prayerful exchange. As acknowledged by Pope Francis, which will serve as an important foundation for the future visitation of the Holy Father to Canada, where healing may continue. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you are our sufficiency and strength, our light and our life, our all in all. When dark clouds of fear and unknowing loom across our hearts. Help us to call to mind the wonderful truth of who you are and of the wonderful security of eternal life we have in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, as we approach Holy Week and Palm Sunday, we thank you for the many benefits we have received in this life from your hand. We pray that our desire to know and draw closer to Christ may continue to grow and expand until the loss of things we value and hold dear are considered as rubbish in order that we may know and gain Christ, who is our all in all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for Canada. Bless and preserve this nation under the shadow of your wing. Remind us always to live by your mercy and not by our own merits. For the you cause the rain and sunshine to fall upon both the good and the wicked alike. Grant safety to all who dwell in our land, both citizens and guests, that all who live here may go about their daily business without fear or terror. Bless our land, yeah. Father, with peace, unity, bountiful seed and harvest. Defend us from all danger and guard and protect us from every evil. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for the world. Lord God of infinite mercy, we humbly implore you to look down on the nations now engaged in war and humanitarian oppression. Do not count your people's sins against them, but grant them true repentance that the lusts and power and desire for power and greed may be conquered by your spirit of gentleness, peace, and righteousness. Look in mercy on those who expo are exposed to peril and need of humanitarian aid. Comfort the prisoner, relieve the suffering of the wounded, and show mercy to the dying. According to your good and gracious will, remove the causes and occasions of this war and restore peace among the nations involved.
and among the global nations that are also involved to bring about peace. May the peace negotiations that are in the works become fruitful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, give us grace not only to truly forgive all our enemies, but also to bless those who persecute us. Keep our thoughts from becoming resentful or seeking revenge, but rather release in our hearts the peace that can only come from casting all our doubts and all our cares on you. Lord, in our mercy, your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for Bishop Michael, Reverend Andrew, Reverend Robert, and all bishops, priests, and deacons. Give them an ever-deepening faith, a firm hope, a burning love which will forever increase in the course of their priestly lives. Comfort, strengthen, and give them courage in their daily responsibilities as they minister unto you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lift our prayers to you for those whose lives are clouded by illness, sorrow, anxieties, and other distresses. We pray that Jesus' presence and peace will bring comfort and healing, as those who care for them will do so with tender and compassionate hearts. I now ask you, as you are kneeling, to pray for those that are on your hearts right now as well. We pray for Hal, Avalon, Verna, Grenville, George, Harold, India, and Jim. We pray for Keith and Heather, Debbie, Linda, and Ken. We pray for Neil and Helena, Edith, Margaret, David, Jim, and Anne. Father, forgive those things we have done which have caused you sadness and those things which we should have done that would have brought you joy. In both we have failed ourselves and you. At this Lenten time, bring us back to that place where our journey began when we said with a resounding yes that we would follow you the way that you first tried. Father, help us, lead us to the cross and meet Jesus there. In his name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and he is infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and he invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, Having received the forgiveness and peace of Christ, we now extend that peace to one another. Uh, you may do that by shaking hands, or you may wave, or you may bow to one another, just as if you would respect uh, each other. And if someone's got their hands like this, it means they wouldn't like to be touched. So uh, please exchange the peace as you feel you're able.
So uh, today after church, we have a parish council meeting, which means that we've got uh, our wardens here and our also parish council. Wardens, can I have you guys come up just quick, quick? <laughs> Jim's like, I'm on the computer. That's okay, you can come. Just to, now we're going to introduce you. Everybody kind of knows most of you. Yeah, come right, come right up here. There we go. Okay, so Vanessa Skelton, Scott Lones, Jim Chapman. This is your parish council for your work. So if you ever have problems, I mean, um, you've got good things to say. Uh, these are the these are the people that come and and, uh, and chat with. Um, both Vanessa and uh, Vanessa was uh, there at Vestry, but uh, we we voted her in, and, uh, and Scott was also voted in at Vestry. We also have parish council. Could you guys stick your hands up, everyone who's on parish council? There you go. Is that what? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, and these guys, and me. Oh, there you go, Bob. Okay, so that's Parish Council. So I'm just going to say a prayer uh, to bless our wardens and, uh, and our Parish Council uh, with wisdom. So let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this church. We thank you for the leaders that have served in the past. Bless them and thank them for their ministry. And Lord, as we begin a new year, we thank you for these who have stepped forward to be wardens in this church, to form a corporation. We thank you for Jim and Vanessa and Scott. Lord, we pray that you would bless them now with godly wisdom. Lord, pray that you'd make them sensitive to your spirit and to each of us in this church. And Lord, we pray as you have called them into this place of responsibility, that you would also provide for them the grace necessary for the office they hold. Bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Father, we pray for all of those who have been elected to parish council, who will serve to uh, help this leadership team, and also, Lord, to, to uh, recommend. Lord, we pray that you would bless parish council, that you would give them wisdom, Lord, that you would make each of our voices come forth, that all of our gifts would be brought to bear for you. We thank you for the unique group of people you have called together for this season in your church's life. And we pray that you would bless them with wisdom and grace. And Lord, that you would give them the grace necessary for the office they now fill. We thank you, Lord, for those who have stepped forward into leadership and pray that you would bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you guys.
giver of life, your Son has destroyed the power of death for all those who believe in him. Accept all that we offer you this day, and strengthen us in faith and in hope. Through Jesus Christ, the Lord of the living. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Jesus Christ, we give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now, with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in God. The gifts of God for the people of God. By way of instruction, everyone in this church is welcome to come forward to the altar. If you would like to receive a blessing, simply put your arms across your chest like this. If you've been baptized in any Christian denomination, you're welcome to receive the bread and the wine. To do that, place one hand inside of the other. If you wouldn't like to receive the chalice today, simply put your arms across your chest and that will say the words the blood of Christ offered for you and then move on to the next person.
In your words and in this Eucharist, we have tasted the promise of your heavenly banquet and the richness of eternal life. May we who bear witness to the death of your Son also proclaim the glory of his resurrection as we wait for his return. For he is Lord forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand. Glory to God, who is power of our goodness, and to the infinite reward of the past of our imagination. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Who is celebrating a birthday? Birthday? Diane, it's your birthday? Pardon me? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, can I pray for you? I'm gonna pray for you way up, from way up there. We're gonna pray for you. Here we are. Father, we give you thanks for Diane. We thank you for her birthday. And we pray, Lord, that you would be blessing this year. Pour your love into her life. In areas, Lord, where she is desperate, we pray that you pour your healing balm. And in places, Lord, where there is joy, we pray you continue to strengthen and uplift her. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, this is also the first Sunday that uh, coffee hour is back, so you are welcome to go to the back of the church, and there is a brand new coffee maker, and I smelled it, and it's not just liquid water, so there's coffee and tea in the back, and Diane and David put on a big spread, so it's lots of food. Please, uh, please stay and, and enjoy some fellowship time. If you're not able to, uh, we love you, and God bless you. The blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you and amongst you now and remain with you always. Amen.
worship has ended. Our service now begins. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.